This is Reframe, the podcast from the College of Education, Health, and Society on the campus of Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. In our last episode, we began to explore the complex subject of human sexuality, as well as why it's still so challenging for educators to provide a proper sexuality education. And so this time, we continue our conversation with certified sexuality educator Rochelle Frabota. We'll talk about the direction society seems to be moving on this issue, and we'll learn more about what Miami's new Sexuality Education Study Center will do for the campus and for the community. Thanks for your time again today. I, I, I'm hoping that this question moves the conversation forward from last episode, but also can serve as a good jumping on point for anyone who may not have listened to the first part yet. Sure. So when talking about the need for more sexuality education, it seems like that's related to how open we are to that idea as a society. So, and, and if you do a basic Google search, you know, just on the sexual revolution, for example, it'll tell you about the time in the 1960s when our culture did start to become more open and accepting. And that's still, anecdotally at least, it's still seen as a turning point of some kind. So is that momentum still continuing? Uh, are, or are we going backwards? Are we regressing? What's happened since then? So to support your point around this idea of the sexual revolution and you know, uh, those of us informed or who have lived through that time period recognize it, you know, my credentialing body, ASECT, came around in 1967. Wades, the Society for the Scientific Study of Sex, was also, I believe in 67, late 60s, you know, without Masters and Johnson pioneering work in creating sex therapy, uh, without the experiments in their lab to talk about, they, they were the first people essentially to write down four stages of sexual response that happened in the 1960s, 50s, 60s, 70s. You know, we depathologized, we took homosexuality out of the uh, the diagnostic statistics manual in 1973. So yeah, there was a lot of movement, a lot of recognition of multicultural, and I do feel like we are um, reflecting those time periods today. And I guess one of the beauties of being an old lady is I now get it because I've seen it. You know, I read about things in books, but now I'm feeling these cycles and I think we're about to head back into a huge shutdown again, a huge pathologizing or medicalizing or shunning or shaming again. I kind of thought we were doing good coming out of it, but to be candid, I mean, I'm thinking of, of several examples. I'm thinking of the, you know Hobby Lobby as a corporation determining what a woman can and cannot choose for her birth control methods based on the insurance they offer. Um, in 2005, Dr. Sufert, who is on our Middletown campus, a great researcher in his applied research facility, was commissioned by the state to investigate Ohio's parents and their teens, and then a third group of just teens, um, feelings and ideas about what should be taught in a sex ed program, if it should be taught, and what the content should be. It came out clearly, I, I feel like 2005, 2007, that abstinence only is not what Ohio's parents and their teens and then this other group of teens wanted. Matter of fact, they wanted a broad curriculum and they wanted it taught by that classroom teacher and they wanted that classroom teacher to be informed. So you tell me. We have a staunch researcher who's well respected, one of our own, with a research study that, went, that was statewide, paid for by the way with I believe abstinence only money, and it came out in a way, research came out in a way that suggested what the state of Ohio was doing wasn't right or working or wanted. Uh, it wasn't wanted, that's what the research really said. And um, yet, what have we done? Nothing. It's 2018 and I, I challenge you to go find the sex ed policy for the state of Ohio. First of all, it doesn't exist. And second of all, it is basically one infusion in a health curriculum about sexually transmitted infections. And there's the hangover from the 2005, uh, uh, the language is escaping me, but the, the money that came from the government to fix the roads also mandated that abstinence only until marriage education be taught in the state of Ohio. And there were A through H criteria and that anybody walking into a classroom teaching anything to do with sexuality had to support or only identify those A through H criteria. 
Um, and James, those are pretty easy to find. Um, having said that, it, it, it's not, that's not progress. I mean, one of the things I love about my work is, is working with folks who want to do this, who are younger than me. Has it been encouraging and inspiring to work with Miami students? Oh, 100%. And that's one of the reasons the Sex Ed Study Center has come about, is because I, I'm proud of my history. Since 2009, when I started here as a visiting, I'm proud to say that I am student-centered, I'm student-focused, and, um, and they are on me as well. And I have, every semester, some of the best and brightest who are advancing ideas and, and in their own learning, coming up with, well, frankly, better ways, which I think is a nice way to, to, to address your original question. It's a give and a take, and this old lady really needs some more giving to happen and less taking, but yeah. So what was behind the genesis of the Sexuality Education Studies Center? How did it come about? How does it align with the EHS vision and mission? Philosophically, it came about, you know, based on this last bit of conversation we were having. I mean, it, there is a huge gap. Um, it's not acceptable for our super smart, overachieving, well-resourced students to not understand that an egg has to come out of the ovary in order for a baby to be made. And then to not understand exactly when that egg is supposed to come out of the ovary um, and the processes that allow that to happen. That's just basic body function that you can do so much with. It's unacceptable. So even though I give you a, a, a very specific example, it's an obvious gap in our culture. And so here at this institution, we can, we can start to have formal conversations via the center. Um, not that we haven't been having conversations, but we now have a location when the center gets to do different things that a department doesn't get to do. So as a center, I get to partner with student services I get to go work with the Ohio Department of Developmental Disabilities. I get to head on down to Hamilton High School and hang out with the special ed teachers and talk shop around how to support their particular body of students with sexual health and wellness. I think that's a great overview. Can you talk maybe a bit more about what are, what are some of the specific projects and partnerships you're working on? Sure. Well, first and foremost, I think it's also important to say the Sexuality Education Studies Center isn't operating in a vacuum. So, uh, you know, we subscribe to, obviously, the college, Education, Health, and Society ideology. You know, I've, I've been in McGuffey Hall and over to Phillips since 2009. This is my academic community. And I uh, have done a lot of guest lecturing for obvious reasons. My very smart, well-resourced, overachieving colleagues also don't always know when an egg pops out of an ovary or what to call it. And a lot of times, and more specifically, and um, you know, I'm doing a lot of work on intersectionality because our college pays attention to this. So a lot of work on talking about sexual identity and orientation and gender, et cetera. So I get to, I get to work here with the people that I've, I've grown attached to in, in buttress um, the ed psych department. I get to, to uh, through an interdisciplinary partnership, get to reinform and, and uninform some bad stuff and work towards some good stuff curricularly. On campus, um, you know, I've had a couple conversations with student health and wellness and what can the center do to, to buttress that programming. And then off campus, because in my 25 years as a sexuality educator in Southwest Ohio, um, I have lots of partnerships, and in particular, a couple of niches. I really appreciate folks with disabilities' uh, journeys, and particular challenges. And you know, I will just say, typical folks don't get sex ed. Guess what? Atypical folks don't get at all. Period. And so, I've done a lot of work, in, in particular, the developmental disabilities community, which includes also autism. So. Matter of fact, when we're leaving, when I leave here today, I have lunch with two of the state of Ohio regional liaisons for the Department of Developmental Disabilities, and we're going to talk state, statewide strategy. When you do these sorts of talks, especially about disabilities, you get, I've heard you say that you have gotten pushback in this role from various people or organizations who are not okay with the ideas that you promote or those who don't even think certain students should receive this kind of education. But is that pushback even more pronounced when you are working with or even trying to approach the idea of working with people with disabilities? Does it take an extra level of explanation to explain why people with disabilities, such as autism, need this education too? 
I mean, in short, the answer is yes. I mean, it takes, it, you know, I, it's probably why I speak in paragraphs. Yeah, it takes more explanation. But what it really takes is the individual that I'm having a conversation with to be open to an explanation. When somebody comes in the room already deciding that their 16-year-old girl has to be a virgin until she's married and hasn't consulted the 16-year-old girl, we've got a problem. Okay, you, you can have your opinion. What I do is student-centered, research-informed, medically accurate, developmentally relevant, age-appropriate education on very many, many, many topics that most people, at least in my 14 years of Catholic education, did not teach me. Yet, I had a ton of education by my interpersonal actions, my parents, my church, my community, watching movies, hearing music. You know, if you want to know what's Rochelle's idea of romance, you go to 1970s um, classic rock and, you know, yacht rock and contemporary adult music and you will understand how I think and feel about romance. I mean, we're informed without really being informed. Everybody thinks they're a sex expert. And I will never tell a parent that they don't know what's best for their kid. That's not a conversation I can have. But if you want to partner with me as somebody who is an expert sexuality educator and so that you can parent your child, um, perhaps a little more effectively, because if what you're doing isn't working, then why not try another way? Then, then let's have that conversation. How unique is the Sexuality Education Study Center? Are there more like it? So again, having been involved in this field, I mostly have been nonprofit. You know, I've always had a side gig. I've always uh, taught adjunct. Uh, I started at Sinclair in Dayton. I've taught adjunct at the University of Dayton, our Middletown campus, University of Cincinnati. Having said that, nonprofit was really my focus. So what I bring to the Sex Ed Study Center is an understanding of, of services and availability. And in academia, this center doesn't really exist, in, especially in our region. Um, so I'm comfortable saying that I don't know of anything else around. Indiana University is, is great with sex ed stuff. Widener University in Pennsylvania, in the, uh, Michigan, uh, sorry, University of Michigan uh, in Ann Arbor. I can tell you where my colleagues are doing great work, where there are perhaps even centers that are doing work, but their focus isn't what our focus is going to be. Yeah, so we're kind of rare. So we're going to offer unique opportunities to students that other, at this point, you know, academic institutions aren't offering. So how can people get involved? Can students or other organizations who may want to partner with you as well, do students have to take your class? Can other organizations just email or call? Can they just walk in your office door and say, what can I do? How can I help? Right. Well, the answer is yes, yes, and yes. I'm approachable. I'm easy to spot in a crowd usually. And having said that, it's just a matter of accessing me and let's finding time to talk about what it is that you think you want or that your group wants. And then I can let you know if we can do it and how we can do it. I'm really open to these partnerships. I mean, I have the luxury now of having this center, even though I, we have been doing this work a lot longer. So let me get the logo on the door. And yeah, um, I would love for people to take my FSW 365 course. You know, it started with 25 students and um, now I can go up to 188. I usually max out around 150. I like a large lecture classroom, so come on. Um, if you want to audit it or take it past fail, great. I, I mean, I, I support the students' goals, but I guarantee you can't be in that classroom for 15 weeks and not leave without having reflected on your personal values, uh, learning new information, um, and at least knowing where to go to find more information when you want it. I know those goals get achieved in 15 weeks. Actually, you can probably do it in three, but yeah. And that, that speaks not to me or to our, our facility here, but to the lack of education out there around sexuality. So if there is someone who wants to start learning more, wants to get more engaged, do you have advice for parents, teachers, students, or anyone who wants to start having these conversations? Do you have advice or just where do people even begin? Yeah, right. Uh, um, well, holler. So the first step is to partner up with a sexpert. And if it's not me, that's your cup of tea. I mean, maybe you're listening to this in, in Washington State. Oh, dude, I got connections. I mean, I am nationally connected. I, I should be able to provide a, a, a quality resource for you, wherever you are. And then, you know, fingers crossed, you'll want to work with me too. 
and having said that, yeah, you need to go to the people. You, you know, you're not going to call a hairdresser to fix your clogged toilet. We really need to understand. Well, okay, I already understand it. Y'all need to understand that my job is legit. And, you know, there are ethics that go with my job. I am a teacher's teacher about sexuality. I think, again, discerning who you're working with, I would not advise you to call a crisis pregnancy center for sexuality education. I, I mean, there are more places I would tell you probably not to call. Um, so I can hook you up with those resources. We can partner. And then, you know, maybe, and this is the part that a lot of people don't want to hear, but maybe start or continue to do your own work around sexuality. So if you, I'm not talking about changing values or beliefs, but there are things that bother us. We have intense emotional reactions. Okay, that's great. But start to do the intellectual work behind it. Because chances are, when it comes to human sexuality, you don't have the medically accurate, research-informed information. You have a knee-jerk, reactionary, culturally infused idea of what the world ought to be like. And if you think I'm wrong, then just wait a minute and see what happens to same-sex marriage. Um, see what happens to transgender folks who want to use medical insurance um, for procedures that they're mandated to go through in order to be identified as the gender to which they want to be identified. There are all sorts of culturally infused politics. So let's just get down to the basics. That's what you can do. And I'm happy to provide sources or books, curricula, poems, artwork to help you start thinking the thinking instead of just feeling. All right. Great. Well, thank you for your time again today, Rochelle Frobota, Certified Sexuality Educator and Coordinator of the new Sexuality Education Center here at Miami. And if you have any questions or if you'd like to get in contact with Rochelle, you can visit the center's website at miamioh.edu slash sesc. And thank you again for listening. If you would like to hear more episodes of our podcast, you can download them for free on iTunes or on SoundCloud.